the screen to let you know we're on. And as before, we will save our questions until the end. Uh, we have a lot of material to share, but what we wanted to do is hit the high points of things that we think you need to know as educators and staff working within schools. We certainly don't think this is the only conversation we, we need to have about this subject. It's ongoing. And as Tanya and I were reflecting, it's constantly changing. So when we looked at our presentation to share with you today, even from six months ago, some of the trends and themes have shifted. So this is sometimes how we think about the internet. It definitely is a, a big black hole in that you can spend a lot of time there and it can be a great place. And as we tell the kids, it's a bit like New York City. Uh, it's a place where anything can happen, where there's a lot of excitement and opportunity, but also a lot of danger. So here's what we'll talk about today. Tanya is going to share with you some of the statistics about children and youth online and what that looks like. We'll also take a look at some of the current popular social media platforms. And for some of you, that might be a review because you know these platforms already. We'll talk about social media dangers. And this is not just based on what we know from media, but also our own experience in Grand Erie. And as many of you know, the behaviors that uh, can happen on social media can lead to consequences, including suspension and criminal charges. We'll talk about sexting and what can happen in those situations and some of the complexities we need to consider when students are involved in that behavior. And then we'll go into talking about when things go wrong. So how can schools help with intervention? And also, how do they assess the dynamics of what they're seeing among their students? Tanya will talk with you about prevention strategies. And again, this, this will be just sort of hitting the high points. And at the end, we'll highlight some of the resources. One of our staff, Michelle Hodges, who's on the call today, our child and youth worker, Michelle, has compiled quite a bit of resources to share with you, and those will be on the staff portal as well as this webinar under our Safe and Inclusive Schools link. So over to you, Tanya, to give us some background. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, so we're going to start with uh, some facts, fiction, um, and see uh, if anything uh, comes up that's surprising to you. So um, we know um, that uh, youth and, and young, younger children than youth are, are very active within uh, social media accounts. Um, so fact or fiction, one in two youth have social media accounts parents don't know about. Go ahead, Christine. So one in two youth have at least one email account or a social media account. Um, and this, uh, this uh, is very common. Uh, a lot of kids have things that they'll, you know, their Instagram account that would be associated to say their name, but then they have something that's called a spam account. Um, many students will have more than two accounts. Um, and just like yourself, you know, I have a work email, I have a personal email, and then we have a family email. So, you know, my name is attached uh, to, you know, three different emails. So, again, students are very much the same um, and at younger ages than we might suspect. Okay, so 50% of teens say that most of their peers do things online that they wouldn't want their parents to know about. Okay, so 74%. Um, and again, this may even be a little bit higher because part of uh, what the struggle is is that um, kids know far more than what we do as adults about what's happening online. Uh, and because as adults we don't know what they know, we tend to come uh, from a place of fear and reactivity. And so uh, a lot of kids hide the things that are happening because they don't want um, to have their devices taken away or, um, you know, to not have the privileges uh, that they've been allowed to have um, with their devices and their online behavior. So one out of 
blank youth report that they have accepted an online request from someone they didn't know. And this number is startling. And so one in three, so a third of our kids um, have friends uh, that they don't know. And a lot of kids, uh, especially with Snapchat, uh, they don't know a high majority of the people. It's through friends of friends where they've connected with people. Instagram is the same. Um, and so this, this information uh, is startling and concerning for a lot of adults because we don't know who our kids are necessarily connected with. And, um, you know, they say, oh, yeah, well, it's, you know, Joey's friend. But is it really Joey's friend? Right. Because who knows who's behind that account? And so, again, cause for concern um, and teaching uh, levels of safety when we're online is what kids really need. Christine, can you push the slide again? So I did. You can't see it? No, I can't. <laughs> okay. It's a blank white screen. Um, if anybody in the chat can indicate, do you see the screen or is it blank uh, and white for you as well? Oh, okay, people I are see seeing it. Do you? Okay, Wayne, thank you. I'm not. Is that showing up for you, Tanya? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Um, so 84% of parents believe their child will confide in them if they are being cyberbullied. Uh, but what percentage actually does? And really, it's only 8%. And so again, uh, the fact that kids do not want to be telling adults or they struggle to tell adults because of uh, maybe our response, they know that um, that uh, adults struggle uh, to uh, understand the same level that they understand. They also don't want um, to lose those privileges, right? So they keep it a secret, um, or they don't want to um, make a situation worse. And so a lot of them uh, will uh, keep it. Uh, under underground. The other thing that happens a lot of time is the per uh, participation uh, on the sidelines, right? So we see a lot of kids who will maybe be a part of a chat uh, and they may not say anything one way or the other, but participating it and not standing up is basically saying that they're part of the problem. And so um, this, this number is very concerning. Uh, and how is it that we can support kids to be open uh, and share the things that are happening for them and others when they're online? Okay, so how are some of the ways that students are using the internet? And again, this changes over, over time and it evolves. And so uh, mobile access, more and more students have a handheld device uh, that they're using. Uh, music is really big. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about social networking uh, in the next few slides. Uh, homework and research. So one of the things that shifted for a lot of students, um, for most students, is now that we're working remotely uh, and not in school buildings. Uh, gaming online is, is, a, is a large part of what uh, students are doing online. Also, where they have the ability to be uh, talking and video sharing while they're playing sport. I mean, while they're doing those games online. Uh, webcams, again, now most devices have built in webcams. So back, uh, I guess, in the good old days when you could buy a webcam and add it to your computer, uh, that's not a choice anymore, right? Most devices have those. So what what is it that... Uh, People are up to not just students, but what is it that you know adults are up to as well with webcams, uh, and what are the dangers in relation to that, and what are the positives? Online shopping. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but at my house, I feel like there's an Amazon package arriving every single day, and I have teenagers, 
Um, so now that they have their, you know, their debit visas or whatever the case may be, uh, online shopping uh, is, is a big part of what uh, older uh, students might be uh, participating in. And then one in 10 students are involved in online gambling. And again, uh, the sporting world uh, has shut down, so maybe not so much so with sports. Um, but again, online card games and things like that, we do have students uh, who are spending time doing some of that as well. So this is... Uh, this is Grand Erie data. So prior to us being off, uh, I had surveyed a school uh, in Brantford uh, in preparation for our presentation. And I wanted to know what would be the, you know, the top five social media platforms that students were using. Uh, and this is the data that they uh, presented to me. And then I spent some time compiling information in relation to each of these social media platforms. And they are in order of um, frequency of use. So YouTube was the most popular reported, and this again is intermediate data, so grades seven and eight. And they talked about uh, their use of YouTube, uh, uploading, watching content. And so some of the concerns in relation to YouTube is it is so easy to land on inappropriate information. Uh, so YouTube also has a younger version for kids. And so part of, part of, uh, for parents and for adults is controlling that that content uh, to ensure that exposure to inappropriate information uh, is controlled somewhat. Uh, there's great things. Uh, kids can learn how to do so many things uh, pro-socially on, uh, on YouTube. The downside is that they can also learn to do uh, some pretty inappropriate things as well. There's the ability to message within YouTube. And so, um, Kids can uh, comment on and give feedback to videos that uh, other students have uploaded. And we do uh, find that there's harassment and some bullying that does take place uh, on the YouTube platform, as well as uh, inappropriate content uh, that students have exposure to. So Instagram is uh, the next popular. And again, for Instagram, it allows students to upload a short video uh, and receive comments, uh, pictures, so still pictures as well. Uh, people can comment. We do see a lot of uh, harassment, bullying, intimidation, threatening that takes place on Instagram. The other part of Instagram is direct messaging. And so that's a place where, you know, individual messages can be sent to individual people along with group chats. And group chats uh, lend themselves to a whole host of different difficulties. The other uh, part of Instagram uh, that we've run up against in safe schools, and I'm sure in other schools as well, um, is that students are making uh, fake accounts and using them, to, using them to do a whole host of different things, uh, usually not for good. And so students, when they're using Instagram, they really want to raise their social profile. And uh, it's kind of like a a popularity contest, right? So how many likes can I get? How many people are following me? And again, if you were to sit down uh, with a, a teenager and say, okay, let's, you know, talk about each person on your followers list, the high majority of students uh, would not know uh, personally uh, each one of their followers, which is, which is concerning again, because it's through friends of friends, or sometimes it's just because somebody has, um, uh, a number of followers, they jump on that so they can be a part of popular culture. Uh, Snapchat is of great concern. <laughs> so we see a lot of issues with Snapchat and over time Snapchat uh, has evolved. So in that students first believed that Snapchat, whatever you put up on Snapchat was gone and was not accessible afterwards. What we do know now is that things that happen on Snapchat are accessible. It's a little bit difficult to get that information, but if there's criminal activity that takes place on Snapchat, police do have access to information that is not gone forever. With Snapchat, one of the things that we've, uh, that's been on an increase is sexting because the pictures can be taken and they would appear to disappear quite quickly. A lot of impulse, uh, 
decisions or impulsive decisions are made uh, and sent through Snapchat. And then again, access to information. So as a, a Snapchat user, you don't really have control about what of the things that are coming in. So you know, pornographic messages or pictures are being sent and you don't know that until uh, it's been opened and you see that in front of your face. So exposure again to inappropriate content, uh, sometimes traumatic content that is having implications for, for students um, is one of the greatest concerns that we have in relation to Snapchat. TikTok, so TikTok used to be called Musical.ly uh, and at its basic uh, premise, I guess, was that kids would get online and they would take a snippet from a song and they would make a video and it would be fun and uplifting. The difficulty is that with TikTok, again, it has the ability to uh, message and comment. So a lot of bullying uh, and harassment takes place on TikTok. The other uh, thing that's happened in the last six months, uh, and I'm not sure if people have uh, become aware of it through the news, uh, but there was a surge of uh, sexual perp perpetrators who were using TikTok, TikTok as one of their vehicles uh, to access young people and get access to information, take part of their picture and use it inappropriately and things like that. So again, all of these social media apps uh, have the ability to expose kids, uh, all of their information. All of them do have safety settings. So for instance, if I talk about Snapchat, I do have a Snapchat account, but with my Snapchat account, I don't have it wide open. So I have a handful of friends. My account is locked down. Uh, people must ask me if they want to be a friend of mine on Snapchat. And so I think educating uh, individuals, students, adults about the safety things that are in place in order to keep you safe. That being said, though, it doesn't take all of the risk away. And so, you know, some of these social media platforms will change their privacy settings without uh, letting us know right away as users. And then that puts us at risk. So, again, it is ever evolving and it, it, uh, is our responsibility as users to stay on top of kind of the themes, the trends, what kids are up to, how they're using uh, all of these vehicles, because it does change over time. Twitter. Uh, so originally Twitter was more of an adult type platform. We're seeing more and more youth uh, take to, to Twitter to communicate, to share thoughts and opinions and ideas. Twitter does have a messaging component as well. So it has the ability to go sideways. Um, and I know that some sometimes uh, and if you follow tweets and where people uh, are sharing some opinions and things like that, it can get quite conflictual and harassment can take place as well. It's quick and it, it's instantaneous. So as soon as something changes, it updates right away. And so, again, just being aware of what kids are up to on, uh, like on, on the Twitter platform, how they're using it. There's a lot of great things, a lot of information sharing, connections that can happen for students, but it can also go sideways quite quick. Okay, so when we're presenting to students, we, we do highlight some of the risks in relation to uh, their health and well-being. So we want them to understand that physically there are some concerns that we need to be aware of. And so, so much research now is going into brain development and uh, the use of technology and how much time we're on uh, our devices. Talking about sleep cycles, a lot of kids are using uh, their phones and in their room. Phones and uh, devices are left in rooms overnight uh, with uh, notifications on, which again is disrupting sleep cycles. Uh, time, and I, I, you know, I can say I fall victim to this too, and I think we all probably, given uh, our current uh, circumstances, the more time that uh, you know we're on technology, we're we're inside, we're not outside, uh, enjoying you know fresh air and the things that we might be doing uh, if we didn't have our device sitting right beside of us. 
uh, beside us. And then the other piece is repetitive strain injuries. So they actually uh, are diagnosing uh, young people with uh, like carpal tunnel and uh, things with their hands and things like that in relation to gaming. And uh, kids are running into some of these struggles a lot younger than say what they might have uh, if they hadn't been, you know, using their gaming devices uh, for lengthy periods of time over an extended period of time. The other concern we have, and we like to express this with kids, is about their emotional mental, and mental well-being because they are inundated with information 24-7. It's constant and all of the time. And so it's all well and good if the messages are positive and uplifting. A lot of times, though, the, the negativity or the social drama and dynamics that are happening within social groups are causing great concern and kids can't get away uh, from that information. Whereas when I was a teenager, you know, I'm thinking of my access to media would have been from the teen magazine that came to my mailbox and I would walk down my driveway and get, you know, my teen magazine from my mailbox. Now that stuff is in front of students' faces all of the time, right? So they open Instagram and it's right there. They open Snapchat and it's right there and it's in their face about, you know, what other students uh, are, you know, the latest, the greatest things, uh, what other people are up to. And so we really want kids to be aware and to be critical about the amount of information that they're taking in and how it's benefiting them. So when we break it down into age and stage, there are some differences uh, with uh, different age groups. So we're going to talk about two. So the first is 7 to 12-year-olds. With our 7 to 12-year-olds, their critical thinking skills uh, to navigate safely, uh, they might be uh, you know, quite a bit more naive around somebody's intentions when they're online. As they're starting to develop who they are, uh, and the things that they might come up against, how that's shaping uh, their values, uh, their moral self, their self-esteem. For kids, social media and technology is a part of their world. It's not going to go away. And so it is, in, it, it is about everything. It's about the food they eat, the pictures they take, the conversations they have, where we may have had conversations more face-to-face, they're having them online. That's just where their world is. And so the, the amount of time that they're spending and helping them to balance is really important. Again, we've talked about game playing and watching videos. That's their primary use. And so, you know, a lot of kids are uh, now able to get on online. They're able to play games in groups in groups of kids that they might go to school with, they might socialize with, but also in groups uh, that might be on the other side of the world who they don't really know who they're playing with. And again, so teaching them safeguards and the ability to be able to distinguish uh, when somebody uh, you know, might be saying something that's inappropriate or makes them feel uncomfortable, we need to teach these skills so that they can keep themselves safe. And just a Canadian statistic that 40% of children in this age range have a smartphone. I know we do have kids uh, that sometimes are even younger having access and some kids who are older than 12 and who don't. Uh, but again, 40%, almost 50% of our kids have their own device on their person all of the time. So what is it that we want to do? And I think this is for every age and stage. We want to create rules and expectations around digital use. Uh, we want to avoid having devices in the bedroom. And this goes for everybody. It's so easy to, um, you know, for, say for even an adult who may be struggling with sleep uh, and I can't sleep and I pick up my device. That picking up the device uh, is interfering with our sleep patterns, right? So teaching and modeling for younger, for our younger students and our, even our own children, uh, about uh, healthy, uh, uh, healthy coping around if I can't sleep, do you know having my device like in the kitchen? I know some homes they have a charging station in the kitchen and everybody puts their devices there at night before they go to bed and things like that. We want to teach etiquette 
around technology and then also filtering programs because for a lot of kids in this age range, they don't have the ability to filter. And so we have to be their external brain. Um, and sometimes accident ha ac accidents happen. So they might put in, say, into YouTube a word um, that might trigger uh, something that's inappropriate, not even understanding what it is they're doing. And then the access to information can be quite upsetting. So with our older age group, our 13 to 17 year olds, just as uh, in everyday life, they're seeking more independence. They are also seeking independence with their devices. They've had more years where they've, used, they've been on technology, social media. Privacy becomes even more important at this age, uh, just as it, w it would in, uh, like in your home with you know, privacy in their bedroom and things like that. We find that a lot of uh, adolescents will um, dig their heels in a little bit more around, well, this is my device and no, you can't look at it and things like that. And so being, uh, and I'm jumping ahead a slide a little bit, but being really clear about expectation and who owns that device uh, and what are the rules around that device? Because at the end of the day, uh, we as adults are going to be in a position to help navigate when things go wrong. So we want to try and be a step ahead of some of that around teaching uh, healthy guidelines and balance. Uh, defining personality and on uh, exploring their identity. So for some kids, this is a place where they try things on, right? They try uh, different ways of being. They try connecting with different groups of people. And this is basically their world. So, you know, when I was in high school, again, I'm going to flip back that, you know, I may have, you know, moved over to this social group or this social group. That stuff's still happening now, but we see more and more of it online. Uh, internet is their primary source of information. And so it's almost like you're cutting off their arm when you say, you know, put the phone down or put it away because that is their connection. And they are without a doubt 24-7 uh, on their devices. One of the things that we like to talk about at this age with kids is about digital uh, reputation and their digital footprint and what uh, they're doing now has an impact on what it will look like in the future and helping them to understand that employers, schools, things like that are doing digital background checks. And so I find at this age when uh, we are doing presentations and we talk about that, they get it a little bit more, right? Because it's not as far away for them to see, you know, that I might be applying to a college or a university, or I might be applying to McDonald's, and they might be doing that background check. So we want kids to be aware that what they're doing right now could impact in the future opportunities. Uh, again, as I was saying earlier, kids will at this age will dig their heels in a little bit more around passwords and access to accounts. And so it's, it's, it's a balance, right, around, you know, if you're making good decisions, and as an adult, I see that you're making good decisions, um, you know, maybe being a little bit more flexible on some of that. But as adults, we really need to know what they're up to, what they're visiting, you know, reviewing their history and things like that, because they are policing themselves. And when we talk to students, our own children, we want to be open and calm, because the greatest deterrent, and I think this is the next slide, Christine, um, the greatest deterrent for kids talking about their social media, internet use is overreaction by adults. And so, again, as I said before, as an adult, it's the unknown. And when we don't know, we come at things from a place of fear. We just want our kids to be safe, whether it's our own kids or students. We don't want bad things to happen. And because we don't know what they know, uh, we do sometimes overreact, right? Because we just want to take it all away and make it better. And the reality is this turns kids uh, to be more underground. And so as adults, we, we need to keep our reaction in check. It's almost like, um, you know, face don't fail me now. I don't want to give a response, right? As I'm trying to process the information. And having kids teach us about those things, like sitting down with, with a student or uh, with your own child and saying, okay, show me what's on your Instagram feed. 
right? We may come across some inappropriate things. Uh, that's okay. Let's have a discussion about that. Who is that person? How do you know them, right? So being able to have our uh, younger people educate us allows them to see that we're willing to engage in some of those conversations that might be more difficult and is not placing judgment on the world that they live in and that they're trying to navigate. Okay, so again, the internet is not a fantasy world. This is their world. And as humans, we're social. Students are social. And if they have mobile access, that's that's what they're going to do. They're going to they're going to use it. We don't want to condemn everything about technology and the internet because there are endless opportunities, right? So for a lot of people, they have connections with people um, in other parts of the world, whether it be friends, family. Uh, at a time like this, where we've been in a position where we've been forced to socially distance, the majority of us, majority of us have taken our relationships online where you know we're doing zoom calls or we're doing facebook messenger and things like that so there are a lot of great things around socializing education uh, all of those things that that we want students to understand that are good for us we just want them to be aware of the dangers and that we need to safeguard ourselves. thank you tanya you're welcome that was great. So we're going to shift now and talk a bit more about when problems happen. And Tanya's done a great job of alluding to many of those. And I'm just going to start there and say that one of the biggest things that we see in Grand Erie is that social media does provide platforms for cyberbullying and victimization. We've also seen teens in our school board, well, and younger kids too, post inappropriate pictures and videos. Uh, film fights, um, take pictures of students in compromising situations. We know at times they've shared um, information about themselves that's put them at risk and left them vulnerable to being targeted by strangers. Some of them have been lured by adults who are seeking sexual contact and we've also had situations where our very younger students have been exposed to inappropriate content. So these are all the dangers that we've seen here in our Grand Erie communities and are also consistent with what we see in the research. One of the things that we know as well from research that impacts why this can be such an issue for our children and youth is what's called an online inhibition effect. And I would say that this is probably true for adults also. And this is the notion that when we're behind a screen, when we're typing rather than face-to-face -face over time, that certainly we start to ease our social restrictions. And we were joking this morning about even how we're dressing differently now at working from home. So the notion that when we're online, we're not completely present or perhaps we're not completely accountable for youth translates into endless opportunity to make errors in judgment. If we couple that with the notion of brain development, and we know that our younger children and youth are still developing that frontal lobe and decision making, as well as the fact that they're, they may be seeking the stimulation, the excitement, the dopamine rush from this ongoing contact with others. Uh, it really does create a situation where it's surprising there aren't more problems than what we see. So we have to remember, as Tanya said, there is a lot of positive for our children and youth about being online. So we want to always give a balanced message. If we come across as being uh, against um, the online world, um, then obviously we will lose our credibility. So for you, we know that being in schools, this is often the place where these issues will come to light. And because we're in a trusted place, a lot of times for children and youth, we become the people that they seek to, uh, you know, get our reaction, get our support, get our help. Um, and this is true for uh, parents as well as youth. So we often have parents who will be calling in to teachers, to administrators asking, what do I do? This is what I found on my child's phone. So I think as educators, we're seen as leaders in this area. And we also know that there's a good reason why we want to be involved in what's happening on social media. 
because it's a space that even though it's not a physical space, it's a space that definitely impacts our school functioning. We talked about bullying, but it's not just that. It's threat making behavior. It's rumors that can get created. It's uh, people posing as other individuals and starting conflicts. There are so many things that, that can affect our school functioning and how people are in relationship with each other. So we definitely want to know and we want to encourage people to report to us. Tanya spoke about one of the most important things being adult reaction and we can't reiterate that enough. It's important to stay calm. And that's a principle that would apply really in any crisis situation that comes about. So even though, again, on the inside, we may feel nervous, we may feel worried, we may worry that we're not going to get it right or say the right thing, that's okay. But we want to try to get a hold of that fear and try to relax and be calm and say to ourselves, you know, we're here to help. And we want to encourage reporting to adults. So how we share that openness is critical in whether or not adults students will continue to come to us as adults. We also know when things go wrong, particularly on social media, it's very complicated. So we need to have a very thorough assessment so that we can design an intervention plan that's appropriate. We have seen firsthand that when there's been an inaccurate assessment, it can literally elevate someone's risk. And that's why we have processes in our school board and community, such as the violence threat risk assessment. So, for example, on the surface, it may look as though a conflict is really only between two students, but as you start to get deeper into that situation, you might find that there's many students in the background who've been puppeting the situation. So we really need to have a thorough assessment. And also collaboration is essential. And again, this would apply to any problem solving that we want to do as, as a school and, and with our community. So ideally we want school, home and community working together to support our youth um, and see that everybody has a role in this work. However, even when we're not maybe able to be on the same page, so say for example, parents aren't as concerned as we would like them to be or police didn't maybe uh, issue a charge and we felt that there should have been, school still has a very powerful role to play. So we often use this acronym to help remind students and ourselves just to think before you post. So talking a bit about sexting, and this is something definitely that has continued to be an ongoing concern in our schools and often as we've spoken about it's the adult reaction that we're dealing with first so the upset of parents maybe the shock of, of teachers or principals who uh, are surprised that that child is involved in this behavior but when we look at the statistics basically 49 percent of students boys and girls grades 7 to 11 are saying that they have received a sext um, by the way they don't they don't define it as sexting they'll, they'll usually refer to it as sending nudes and we have to understand that contextually youth engaging in this behavior do not view it in the same way as adults do. Um, so they don't layer on necessarily the moral uh, lens on this behavior. For them, depending on the peer group, it may be part of what they believe is acceptable. So sometimes it gets difficult to really understand these situations, which is why we need to do some very good assessment. And we also know that uh, boys actually uh, are more victim in this regard than girls or than females. But what tends to happen is boys are unlikely to come forward and report that pictures of them are being forwarded. So why do students engage in this behavior? And I think, again, we want to understand the context and also the current culture when we think about why uh, our our adolescents would engage in this and certainly it's it's we want to think about de developmental age and where this fits with much younger children obviously that's going to be uh, a very different level of concern than between two 17 year old uh, teenagers for example so circumstances behind sexting often it occurs in the context of a relationship and what we tend to see is that um, the, the people who are exchanging those photographs may be feeling that they've done so voluntarily. 
Where the problem occurs, though, is when those images may be forwarded to other individuals who weren't meant to see those in, those images, or where there's been a breakup and somebody wants to hurt the other person. We also know that a lot of our children and youth might engage in this behavior uh, to be funny. So sometimes it could be a dare or a challenge. Um, sometimes it's for popularity or acceptance. Uh, sometimes it's purely for fun. So again, it may not be something that they've really thought through and may not be applying a moral lens. And we want to be thoughtful about that as we're talking to them about their thoughts and feelings about that behavior. Although the third circumstance is the most concerning, coercive circumstances, we do see those as well. And this could be peers, partners, online acquaintances, strangers demanding images or coercing our, our our youth to share information or pictures and we have seen that as well. So considerations for assessment and I think one of the first things you want to do as an adult thinking about these things is sort of what's your understanding of social media and what's your own relationship with it as well what are your personal biases that might come in as you're trying to understand this situation and, and as I've said I know I've spoken with lots of staff over the years who've sometimes really grappled with their own feelings that uh, they're very disappointed that uh, that someone that a student that they may have seen as a role model to other students might have engaged in this behavior so we want to really think about what are we bringing to the investigation and then we want to look at who are the people involved what is their role how have they been impacted what is the community uh, impact? Sometimes things go viral. They get sent around to, um, you know, to other teenagers, sorry, youth and teenagers in the community, parents. Uh, sometimes things make their way to Facebook. So things can get very big on social media and we want to consider the impact zone. So who are all the people who might have been impacted? One of the really important things that our team talks a lot about is peer dynamics, and that is really understanding clearly what are the interrelationships between the peers involved. Sometimes this may involve other schools, and so sometimes you might need to collaborate with other buildings and find out about the students involved in that building. And as we do that, it helps us really understand what interventions need to be at play. We also need to think about mitigating circumstances. So what were the events that were leading up to this situation? So for example, if a threat happens online between a student and another student, we would definitely want to know what's led up to this. What has been happening that we might need to understand before we react just to the behavior alone? As we start to unpack all of this, we ask the question, who needs support? And finally, what are some of the interventions that might help restore relationships? Because at the end of the day, uh, as Tanya has mentioned, social media is meant to be social. It's meant to share and, and have relationships. So usually, but not always, uh, when things have gone wrong on social media, kids do want to restore relationships or make it right. Not always, but usually. So some of you may have seen the uh, the triangle that we present um, in safe schools when we talk about social and peer dynamics. And when we think about power in society and we talk with students about that, we often depict it as a power triangle so they can visualize that at the top of the triangle are often the people or the roles where power lies. And as we go down that triangle, we have persons with lesser and lesser power. Uh, or control and that can be for good reasons so for in a family in a family for example you would want the parents at the top of that pyramid and the children would be underneath and in a school you would want administrators to be at the lead in a classroom though when we look at dynamics or we look in a peer group sometimes these mapping it in this way on a triangle will help you understand the interrelationships between the kids so who in those relationships has social power and who might not have any power at all. So shifting to interventions, we've sort of put them in four categories. And the first one is supportive. And usually this is thinking about the person who's been victimized and particularly if there's been threat making or uh, pictures have been shared about them, things have been said about them, rumors, 
all those kinds of things. We need to look at how we're going to support that individual student. This would involve the parent, absolutely, this development of a support plan. Sometimes we write it up as a formal student support plan, but all along the way, no matter what we do around support, we want to ensure that there's student voice. And as we've said here on this slide, ultimately, most in most cases, students want to be back in relationship with one another. So um, however we can restore relationships, that's that's our hope. Disciplinary is the other part of intervention, though, and we often see suspensions in response to high level behaviors involving errors online. Uh, police may issue charges. Certainly, they are often called in these situations. They will do their own parallel process. It doesn't mean that they uh, will have the same outcome as we might or understand it in the same way. We do try to collaborate, though, so that we um, can communicate a consistent message. Parents can be involved in, I guess, being open with us and reporting and, and working with us to hold students accountable and also to support them and also enforce some discipline at home. But if parents aren't involved, as I said, or they're not supportive, it doesn't mean we can't still make an impact. We've talked a bit about restorative, and even if we can't bring people together in a restorative meeting or a circle, looking at things through a restorative lens is important. And that's really thinking about how do we ensure that people have a voice how do we ensure that people who've been harmed um, can help us inform strategy to make things right? How can we consider how the community might have been harmed and who needs to be reassured that we're going to uh, create a safe space and that we're going to address what's happened? And then finally, educative. And I think this is where we play such a big role as well. I know our team has done quite a bit of work in this area and uh, hope to continue to work with yourselves and our support staff colleagues on how do we inform students? How do we bring internet safety, social media safety into our lessons, into our classrooms, into our conversations? We want to promote that idea of digital citizenship. We want to involve parents and help them be more aware of what internet social media safety looks like and we want to try to keep the conversation going so it's not just a one a one shot deal it's just a little more specific here when we do have sexual exploitation or distribution of images and this would be in cases where uh, someone has been victimized um, these investigations are, again, usually parallel processes with the police of jurisdiction, and we do have a police and school board protocol that outlines how we work together in these cases. And really, again, the principal in this situation would just be doing a really good assessment, but they would also be looking at the context of, of the, the nature of the image and uh, who, was, who received it, who sent it, what was the size of the distribution. And that helps principals work together with the police, with the parents, often with safe schools on determining what our intervention is going to be. And, you know, around this issue, we've seen everything from charges to needing students to be uh, moved to different schools to restorative meetings where we have brought students together to um, meet together and talk through what's happened. Prevention is the key, though. We'd rather prevent than clean up after the fact. So back over to you, Tanya, to talk about some of the things we can do in uh, prevention. OK, thank you. OK, so one of the things that we want kids and students and adults, everybody to understand is that technology is designed for sharing. We need to understand that nothing on the internet is 100% private. So the acronym think before you post is very important. And so often individuals will believe that, well, if I'm having a conversation with just you, nobody knows about it. Very few applications uh, will notify you if somebody has screenshotted something. So Snapchat does that now. But if I'm having a text conversation with somebody, 
it doesn't tell them if I've screenshotted my the conversation and sent it out. So again, just reinforcing that technology is about sharing. It wasn't designed for private conversation and that it's public. And what you put out there is out there to stay. Even if you erase it, you take it off your profile, it's out there. So if, you know, again, somebody has taken a screenshot, if somebody's downloaded that picture, it's now on their device. So just because we uh, erase it at the source doesn't mean that it's necessarily gone. And so we need students to understand that. This is our Code of Digital Citizenship. And again, this is uh, something that we go over when we are uh, doing presentations with students. So helping them to understand uh, their responsibilities around protect and respect. So prevention, where we would love to spend the majority of our energy is encouraging students to post positive messages, the pro-social things. Uh, engaging students in talking about developing digital consciousness. So really understanding what does it mean to have a, a digital conscious uh, consciousness? What does it mean uh, to explore your digital footprint? And how might your behavior right now impact opportunities in the future? We want to encourage critical thinking, but especially critical thinking about pornography and the messages uh, that they're receiving by looking at images, watching videos and things like that. Um, we want kids to be critical thinkers about all of their opportunities and the information that they're accessing online, especially though about the things that are gonna be sh shaping uh, and forming their values and their morals and how they feel about themselves. Courageous conversations. So looking for opportunities to have those conversations um, whether it be with your students or parents about, you know, what are our kids up to? How are they spending their time? What are ways that we can promote positive use of social media platforms and technology? Making positive connections with technology. So using it as a part of education and curriculum. And again, in this current climate, uh, that's something that we're all doing in support of our students. And so really we're, we are teaching them uh, now, but in the past as well, how it is that we can access technology in a positive way. Setting rules and expectations, again, to help guide interactions and behavior online. And then as spoken about before, we want to encourage critical thinking about all of the aspects of online behavior. Again, more courageous conversations, um, talking about stereotypes that are perpetuated on social media and kind of thoughts and opinions uh, that might be contrary to how people uh, see things or might be in line with how people think, see things and how we can uh, challenge some of that thinking. Knowing the risks uh, involved with too much time online and the impacts that uh, it individuals may experience because of online uh, time and activities. Um, and then sometimes and not, we have students who turn to social media and uh, texting, blogging, things like that when things aren't going well. So helping individuals to see that there are other avenues for support so that they, they feel supportive and that they're not just putting negative messages out into um, the universe, so to speak, and hoping that somebody uh, will uh, ask them if they're okay or offer to support them, that finding uh, healthy channels and means of uh, getting that support is really important. Because sometimes students will, when they're struggling, turn to social media as a way to try and uh, deal with incidents or how they're feeling about themselves. Okay, so some of the things um, for us as staff um, that we need to consider. So just as with students, what does our online profile say about um, us? And so one of the things when I'm doing presentations with students, I often uh, share with them is that you know, if I was doing a presentation with you today and you had one opinion of me, 
um, and let's say it was a positive opinion about how I've presented or the information that I've shared. And then you were to go home tonight and you were to Google my name and uh, my Pinterest account came up because I've used my name as my Pinterest login. And then on my Pinterest account, you were you were able to see uh, things that weren't consistent with who you met in person. Right. So, again, that's an online profile. And what does that say about me uh, in relation to my reputation? What does that say um, as uh, me as a professional and things like that? Considerations. Oh. Sorry, Christine, I was just going to talk about some considerations and something that we've had to tackle over the last couple of months is our relationship online um, with students and information sharing and things like that, which is also uh, important for our setting boundaries uh, for ourselves. For parents, how do we support parents? So encouraging to set uh, reasonable time limits for screen time. So having a healthy uh, routine around social media and technology use. Teaching about social media apps, and we've talked about that. Encouraging parents to sit down uh, with their kids or educating themselves about what the, what the apps uh, that their kids are using and what they're about and what they're for. And then teaching healthy boundaries and having conversations about those. Thank you, Tanya. That was excellent. So here's some of the resources that uh, we would recommend from our Safe Schools team. We have a uh, some resources on the portal and Michelle Hodges will be sending more to be uploaded. We'll also post this PowerPoint and webinar as well for you to have access to. These are some of the websites that we often go to for information. So the Canadian Centre for Child Protection is an excellent one. There's also lessons on there for teachers. Common Sense Media is another one that gives good advice, not just for educators, but for parents also. And those are some of the other ones. Not all of those are, can, are uh, Canadian, some are American. So lots of great resources out there. But as always, feel free to reach out to any of us. So um, I know we're coming upon our one hour now, but I did promise to leave a little bit of time if people want to ask us any questions. Uh, if you'd prefer to consult with us because it's more of a specific situation, again, please feel free to email us. So over to the Q&A to see if there's any questions. Cindy wanted to know where do we find the webinars? So if you go into the staff portal from the main Grand Erie website page under departments, it's safe and inclusive schools. If you scroll down, it'll list all the things that are in the portal as far as resources. If you scroll down to the bottom of the list, you'll see the tab webinar. If you click on that, all of the webinars that we've done um, this spring, as well as all of the PowerPoints and the resources are all uploaded there. So uh, just shoot me an email if you have any difficulty accessing any of that. The other place is the uh, board YouTube channel. So the board has uploaded our webinars to the YouTube channel as well. 